So welcome to day three, video one. And as I have said, uh, the first video every day will be uh, dedicated to um, a theme in uh, wisdom from world religions. Um, the theme for today is the spiritual anchor of the material world. And the spiritual law, which is a direct quote from Sir John Templeton, is your true anchorage is not in things temporary, but in things eternal. Um, so, uh, and, the, and today uh, I want to pick up on a theme, pick up on uh, a theme from, uh, from yesterday, and I want to say a few words about uh, a really important discovery in neuroscience that bears directly upon the reality and significance of human spiritual experience. But before I uh, speak about that, let me just very quickly say what our learning objectives for this session will be, and they are the learning how to recognize the difference between a materialistic and a spiritual view of life. And connected with that is my attempt to argue um, that basing, our, um, basing the material world and our experience as material objects in a material universe, basing this upon a spiritual reality is truer to our full experience as human beings than just basing it upon uh, a materialistic understanding of life, which has been one of the tendencies in modern Western thought for the last few centuries, although that does seem to be dissolving a bit. And third, to argue that a full and satisfying picture of human experience really requires us to supplement a materialistic approach with a spiritual view of life. So, um, there uh, is a famous uh, experiment uh, that's been uh, done numerous times by Andrew Newberg uh, and his colleagues, including uh, early on uh, Eugene D'Acoli. Um, and this has, th this, this experiment and its results has become part of what uh, Dr. Newberg refers to as uh, neurotheology, and that I like to refer to as contemplative neuroscience for those who may find the theology word not something that they can work with. And this central finding uh, basically holds that when we enter into a state of deep concentration, there's a, a kind of neurophysiological signature that can be detected whenever we are in this state. And that is, there is, to use some technical language, and believe me, I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm a, I'm a professor of religious studies, and the very fact that I'm even venturing into this area is, a, on my part, a kind of humility uh, to be open to knowledge in an area where I'm not trained, but that is of great significance for what uh, our spiritual, uh, the spiritual reality of life. And whenever someone enters into a deep state of concentration and the uh, various uh, scanning devices that are used in neuroscience detect that what occurs is there's a deafferentation of neural impulses in what's called the PSPL, or the posterior superior parietal lobe. That basically what that means is there's a reduction in activity, in neural activity in that part of the brain, and, a cons and consequently reduced blood flow. And this basically, whenever this occurs, it means someone's in a deep state of mystical consciousness. And what this then shows is that spiritual experience, deep spiritual experience, is not something made up. It's not false. It's not necessarily, it's not a sign of disease. And in fact, that religious experience is grounded in a definite state of the brain. Of course, immediately, uh, it seems that we've won one victory, and that is showing the reality of spiritual experience but while losing the whole battle, because now it seems that uh, we can reduce spirituality to brain states. And I would actually say that uh, that's not necessarily the case. And this is where my humility, I think, may become a bit of boldness. Because what I think it does is it shows us that, in fact, uh, we, we, as human beings with brains, we have a kind of a device here, like a smartphone, that's able to uh, download information from the spiritual realm. Now, t take your smartphone for, 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 for an example. Most of us have smartphones these days. If not, think of a radio or a television. Um, the signal that we receive from the Internet and our smartphone is not itself generated by the smartphone. 
Now, on a materialistic view, there should be no external signals coming in, except maybe from society or from your parenting. All the signals are internal. It's like if you have a smartphone and you're in the plane, you have airplane mode turned on. Or you're not getting anything. Maybe you can get the wireless from the plane. But let's just say your wireless is turned off, your airplane mode is on, you can look at your pictures, read your Kindle, but you can't, you don't know what's going on outside the plane. As soon as that plane lands, you've got airplane mode on, your network kicks in, you're connected to the internet again. And it's like that with us. Materialism insists that we are basically smartphones in eternal airplane mode. And what spirituality says is that, no, actually, we're like a smartphone, and we've got an internet connection, and the deep connection we have is to our spiritual nature. And we receive information from that depth level of life. We receive a signal. That signal is revelation, insight. It's the great religious teachings of the world. Also, this information came through great poets. You might say poetry is the foundational discipline of all because the great poets were inspired to see and to record and to report upon these invisible realms of spirit. The, the greatest religions are grounded in great, for the people who love it, great poetry, great literature. So, none of this is to deny science in any way. It's not to become a, a debunker of climate science or to become a creationist. It's to simply say that materialism itself, which is a helpful, in limited circumstances, uh, understanding of life, cannot account for the fullness of human experience. Materialism cannot account for our ethical intuitions except by reducing them to something else. Our spiritual experiences are, are not explicable except as reduction to something else. Our aesthetic appreciation, the supremacy of love, and the unquenchable yearning that we experience for ultimate fulfillment. Evolution could simply have evolved us as simple creatures that gather some food and nutriment. We don't need to have these brains that can think the great poetry and the great religious traditions and that can conceive of a life after death in which everything is united in one glowing divine whole. We don't need any of that just to go out and feed. It's just not necessary. Materialism, as, the, as a metaphysical viewpoint for science, and uh, is too weak of a read to bear the weight of our full human nature. And this is not a call to reject science. It's a call, along with Sir, Sir, Sir John, to expand the metaphysical breadth of science so that it is open in an empirically disciplined manner to the reported spiritual and aesthetic and, uh, uh, and, and ethical intuitions that have always guided humanity from the beginning, long before there was an organized discipline called science. And even if everything else were to disappear, these spiritual intuitions would still illumine our lives, and they would be the most precious uh, insights that we would have. Um, and so, I think that alongside the physical signals that our brain receives uh, from the body and through the senses, there are non-physical signals. There's non-physical information as well that we receive. And this would incorporating this would lead to a fuller understanding of life, one that is more satisfying to our deepest intuitions. How sad and how limited a view of life it is to assume that we're only about passing our genetic information on to the next generation. True as that is, it cannot account for the fullness of our lives. This is probably the reason why, and I've said this often in my undergraduate classrooms, think about a, a memorial service for somebody who had no real spiritual or religious inclinations. You might have a song or a poem, a favorite song, a favorite poem, maybe a beautiful picture, maybe someone singing, but you would not invite, a, I don't know, a, a chemist to come and give a talk on chemistry. You wouldn't invite a, an accountant to come and give a, a talk on accountancy. Why? Because they're not appropriate in that context. And why not? Because they're not even relevant at a moment like that. So what is relevant are our spiritual intuitions, which are the most important aspect of our lives, our ethical intuitions, our aesthetic intuitions, our sense for beauty, our sense for truth, our sense that cannot be erased, that there is a right way to do things. And that to violate that in some deep way is to go against our, our, our most basic nature. No explaining of any of these intuitions away will ever succeed for any great length of time because it creates a stunted humanity. And we need to reclaim our full humanity here in the 21st century after centuries of materialistic reductionism. We need to regain that, and we can regain it through 
work through interaction, as, as Sir John pointed out, interaction with the great wisdom traditions of, of our planet. We don't have to become fundamentalists or literalists or, or, or um, reactionaries. In, to do this, we can have the humility of mind that allows us to find from all sources, scientific, humanistic, and religious, what is useful and beneficial for living a full-spectrum life.